Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for giving us your word. And Lord Jesus, we praise your name for the revelation you have made unto us, which we couldn't have known in any other way. We're asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will throw light on your word tonight, penetrate every heart, enlighten every heart, and prepare us for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that all these studies will not be lost on us, that we will find our way, find ourselves, take it to ourselves, and be who you want us to be, waiting, watching, worthy, ready. At a time, any time, you will come for your church. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As you notice, we've been studying from Mark chapter 13. And actually, Mark chapter 13 came as a result of the question that disciples asked the Lord. And those questions came, that demand came, because of what Jesus Christ had said. Not only what he said previously in the earlier chapter, but all through the ministry. Number one, he had said that he will die. He will go to the cross and he will be buried. On the third day, he will rise again. That came as a surprise to them because they had thought of the king coming. And when they heard that Jesus Christ had come, in fact, they introduced him to other people that they wanted to bring to the Lord, saying, we have seen, we have met the king of Israel. And when these people came to the Lord, and the Lord revealed something in their lives, they said, Thou art the king of Israel. And they were surprised that he was saying he was going to die. He will be buried. On the third day, he will rise again. Not only that, he has spoken to them about the parables of the kingdom. And in talking about the parables of the kingdom, he had alerted them that at the end of the world, that there will be the reapers, and the reapers will gather the grace and the wheat into the garner, and then they test the useless seed they will throw into the fire. And he said, so shall it be at the end of the world. And he was surprised about that because they had thought about worlds without end. But now he was talking about the end of the world. And then eventually he spoke about his coming. That he will come again. Again that surprised them. They thought you had come already. And where would you go that you'll come again? Because of those reasons, the death of Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, the coming again, as well as the end of the world, that generated questions in their hearts. Not that they did not believe. They believed that everything Jesus said was a fact and was the truth. They were now asking, when will lead be? What will be the signs of your coming? And what will be the signs of the age of the age? And what will be the sign of all these things, the temple being blown down and not one stone left upon another. That's why Jesus now began to enlighten them. And as enlightening them, we have the record of that in the whole of Mark chapter 13. We've studied already from verse 1 all through to verse 8 when Jesus said, Let no man deceive you, because there are the false prophets that will come and they'll deceive many. But you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, of pestilences and of trouble everywhere. Let not your heart be troubled. These things must be, but the final end you have heard about is not yet. Because all these things that will happen at the beginning of sorrows. Now he continues to tell them, today we're in Mark chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 9 also to verse 13. 
Mark chapter 13, verses 9 to 13. And this is talking about the preservation of believers, the preservation of steadfast believers, the final preservation of steadfast believers. Open your Bible now to Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogue, and ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before the rulers and the kings for my sake and for a testimony against them. And then in verse 10, it tells us in verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached among all nations. Verse 11 says, eh, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought, don't be anxious, and don't be worried, and don't be premeditating, take no thought beforehand. What ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that hour of uh, questioning them, that hour of examining them, that hour of delivering them to the council and delivering them to the judges and to the uh, laws, uh, lawyers, lawmakers of the land. It says, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that ye shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. And uh, but the Holy Ghost in verse 12, uh, it says in verse 12, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. We'll come to the final verse we're studying today in verse 13. Uh, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He said at that time, remember, he's talking about the time after he would have gone at the time when the disciples will be by themselves, and then all through the generations that will come after, until the end, until the time when they is coming, is very near. And he said, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end. He says, There are those who will endure persecution, trial, and they, uh, they will endure all the oppression, They'll endure everything they will go through for the name, for the name of Christ and for the sake of Christ. And it says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Those are the verses we're looking at today. Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through to 13. The final preservation of steadfast believers. Final preservation that was saved now. That's great. But in all the temptations that will come, in all the trials that will come, in all the oppression, oppressive regime that may come, in all the things that may come upon the believer, upon the church. Remember he said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. There is strength in the church. There is strength in the believer. There is strength in the family of God. When you come to God, he puts that staying power, he puts that stabilizing power, he puts that enduring power in you and every member of the body of Christ, truly born again regenerated, redeemed set apart for the Lord and saved, sanctified child of God, we can be steadfast and we can be preserved until the final day, the final preservation of steadfast believers. There are three things we're looking at as we look at this, uh, at this uh, passage of Scripture. Point number one, saints' watchfulness during severe persecution. Persecution mild, persecution intense, persecution severe, persecution terrible, whatever form of persecution, the watchfulness we ought to have. Saints' watchfulness during severe persecution. Point number two, Spirit-filled witnesses devoted to soul-saving proclamation. 
That is, in the midst of whatever we're going through, in the midst of the general situation that will come at the time of uh, Christ's coming, very near the time of the Lord's coming, and throughout the generations of the people that are following after the Lord until he will come. Persecution or no persecution, trial or no trial, and the vicissitudes of life that may be here and there, up and down, whatever the situation. The witnesses to Christ and the preachers of the gospel, they are devoted to soul-saving preaching, soul-saving proclamation, soul-saving publishing of the gospel, the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit filled witnesses devoted to soul saving proclamation point number three stranding the watchmen watchmen are preachers watchmen are soul winners watchmen are the believers they are watching over their own lives they are watching over believers around them and they are watching for souls to be saved they are watchmen and like god called ezekiel watchman he calls every one of us watchmen and he has given us the gospel he has given us the word that we are to preach strengthened watchmen dedicated in a steadfast perseverance steadfast perseverance there's persecution and then we go on proclaiming the watch of the lord and there is perseverance we continue until the lord will come let's go to point number one now in point number one we're looking at saints watchfulness during severe persecution and we're reading verses 9 and 12. Look at verse 9. But take it to yourselves. Underline that in your Bible. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues. And ye shall be beaten, is part of the persecution. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Underline that too, for my sake. For a testimony against them. And then in verse 12, in verse 12, it says, Now brother shall uh, betray brother to death, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to, the, to be put to death. If you put those two verses together, there's a sentence that comes out of those uh, verses. This is the sentence. Take heed to yourselves, live for his sake, faithfully enduring persecution. Everything together. Take heed to yourselves, live for his sake, faithfully enduring persecution. And that long sentence, I'm going to break up to three. And the first part of the sentence is, take it to yourselves. The second part of that sentence is, live for his sake. And then the final part of that, faithfully enduring persecution. Look at the first part of the sentence I give you now. Take heed to yourselves. We we'll look at that uh, chapter 13 of Mark. And we're reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 13, verse 9. And you see the words right there. But take heed to yourselves. But take heed to yourselves. For they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogue, ye shall be beaten. That's the persecution. And that's why you take it yourself. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony against them. Now, those words, take it yourselves, appear in different uh, parts of the Bible. And it's telling us that as the Lord is coming, and when we're getting near to the coming of the Lord, there are things that will happen that might make somebody forget himself, that might make somebody give up, that might make somebody not take heed and not look through, through his life to see that I ought to take heed and be firm and I ought to be stable, I ought to be solid, I ought to be committed to the Lord. Look at Joshua chapter 23. It says in Joshua chapter 23, reading from verse 11, Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves. The same thing. Take heed to yourself. Take good heed to yourselves. 
you know, we have uh, the tendency of watching over other people, taking heed what other people do, what other people do not do, and we forget ourselves as soldiers on the battlefield, as children of God, as pilgrims sojourning on our way to heaven, uh, as we're taking it to other people and to the work of the Lord and to the members of the church and to everyone around us, we take heed, good heed, therefore unto ourselves that she loved the Lord your God is saying that when those persecutions arise, when those difficulties and challenges come, we must continue to love the Lord because that is the secret of abiding till the end. That is the secret of standing firm till the end. That is the secret of going on and on in the Lord without ever compromising. Look at verse 12. It says in verse 12, take it yourselves or else if you do in any wise go back and cling to the remnant of these nations. What's the connection between take it yourselves and then get him back to the remnant of these nations. The connection is this. When they get to the land, they'll see that the people of the land, they're mightier, they're stronger, they're higher, they're richer, they're more intelligent, and they'll be attracted to them. And if they were attracted to them in relationship and in marriage and in making families together, they'll be joining uh, on equal yoke. They'll be joining people that were not similar, not having the same faith, not serving the same God. And so he said, when you get to the land, whatever challenges you see, whatever difficulties you have, Whatever delay you might have, you take it yourselves that you do not cleave, you do not go back or cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and dare to you. Then in verse 13, it says in verse 13, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from up this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. It's telling us today that as we see the Lord coming, and sometimes you go through loneliness, sometimes you go through some delay, sometimes you go through some challenges, and you might, uh, if you don't take it to yourself, you might think, well, I'll just choose anybody I want. On equal yoke or equal yoke, whatever, I'll just choose anybody. They say they're of the world, they say they're sinners, but they're rich. They say they're sinners, but they're doing well. They say they're sinners, but they're getting on in life. It says, take heed unto yourselves. Now we come to the New Testament. Take heed unto yourselves in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. The words of Jesus, and he has not stopped telling us, challenging us, warning us. He says, and take it to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that they come upon you unawares. He's saying we ought to be careful, we ought to be watchful, we ought to be sober, we ought to take heed unto ourselves. Let me ask you, why are you serving the Lord? Why do you claim to be born again? Why do you come to the church? Why do you study the Bible? You see, there are people at the time of persecution, at the time of job loss, at the time of oppression, at the time of famine, at the time of scarcity, at the time of pandemic, the only thing they'll be thinking about, their hearts will be overcharged with, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Well, with that, shall we be clothed? And their hearts will be occupied with the cares of this life. And the Lord is saying, that is the trick of the evil one, the trick of the devil. He'll want you to concentrate on what to eat and what to drink, and the cares of this life, and as you are like that, and you are not thinking 
of the coming of the Lord. You are not thinking of the preaching of the gospel. You are not thinking of the work he has given us occupy until I come. That day will come upon you unawares. Look at verse 35. It says in verse 35, For as a snare shall it come, was that it there? As a snare shall the day come, the day of rapture, the day of his coming, the day of Christ coming back again. As a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Understand? When we talk about the coming of the Lord and what will happen after the rapture, it is on the whole earth. It's not Israel alone. It's not the Gentiles alone. It's not a few selected countries alone. That will come upon the face of the whole earth. But then he says in verse 36, in verse 36, Watch ye therefore. That's still saying the same thing. Take it to yourselves. Watch ye therefore and pray always. And pray always. What kind of prayer? That I will have money. What kind of prayer? That I will have an easy life. What kind of prayer? That I will have all the substance of this world. What kind of prayer? That I will join land to land and build house upon houses. What, what kind of prayer? That my business will expand. We're talking of something more serious. What are we talking about? Pray ye always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. It's talking about all the, all the affliction and the adversity of the great commission that shall come. It says pray that you will escape, that you will go away in the rapture before those things happen. And how many of us actually pray so that at that time when Christ will come, I will not be left behind. You will not be left behind. How many of us actually pray that we will escape the coming tribulation, the great tribulation? And that's exactly what Jesus said we should pray for as we see the signs that are happening. It says we pray always to be accounted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now the sentence uh, I started with, take heed to yourselves, live for his sake. Live for his sake. We're coming back to Mark chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 13. We're reading from verse 9. It says, Take it yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogue ye shall be beaten, for ye shall be brought before rulers and kings. Look at this. For my sake. You'll be brought before the people that will challenge your faith, before the persecutors, before rulers, before kings, before councils, and in before synagogues, in their sanctuaries, they will challenge you. The religion of the day will challenge you. The amalgamation of a religions coming together, they will challenge you. Why are you not following the tradition of the elders? Why are you not following the principles that all the denominations have said? Why are you following a different pattern? Then you have to tell them and give your testimony. How you became born again. How you became a child of God. How you have allegiance. You owe allegiance unto Christ and Christ alone. And everything you say in their presence, you will not be thinking about yourself for your own sake. You will not be thinking about what you will get, what you lose. You will not be thinking about your esteem. You will not be thinking about uh, what they will think about you. Everything you say, everything you do at such a time of persecution, at such a time of difficulty, at such a time of challenge will be for his sake. Because he said, it's for my sake and for a testimony unto them. Look at Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 18. And understand what to endure everything for his sake. He says, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. Very important. In our lives, everything we do in the office, everything we do in the home, everything we do in the community, the life we live, 
the testimony we give and the stand we take and the unbending, unyielding situation we put ourselves and we say, This I do. And this I continue doing. Remember, every time for his sake. What are the things you do? Is it for his sake? What are the things you don't do? Is it for his sake? Where are the places you go? Is it for his sake? If you gamble, can you do that for his sake? If you go to a nightclub, can you do that for his sake? For his sake? If you join a gang of evil doers, can you do that for his sake? If you break down and destroy and scatter, can you do that for his sake? If you riot, can you do that for his sake? But you know, when you live righteously, when you live holily, when you live soberly, when you live according to the word of God, and when you live in such a way that you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord for his sake and for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. It says whether they're religious or irreligious, whether they believe in God or they don't believe in God, whether they are idolaters or they are pagans, even before the Gentiles, everything you do, you'll not say they don't know Bible. Therefore, they will not understand. They don't uh, read the word of God. Therefore, they will not understand. They don't uh, have doctrine. Therefore, they will not understand. Don't worry about that. Whatever you know, how to please the Lord, how to live for God, you keep on living for his sake. Whether they will understand or they will not understand. And then in that Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, it says, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what it shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. How and why? Verse 20 tells us. And it tells us in verse 20. It says in verse 20. For it is not ye that speak. It says abandon yourself in the hands of the Lord. Don't even think about yourself. How do I approach this? Don't think about that. How do I come after this? Don't think about that. How do I overcome that? Don't think about that. Are they stronger than who I am? Are they greater? Are they higher? Are they more forceful? Can they do this? Can they do that? It says, don't even think about that. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Which speaketh in you. It talks about the Holy Ghost is the spirit of the Father, is around us, is upon us, is beside us, and it dwells inside us. And it says it is the spirit of the Father that will quicken us, that will give us the word, and then the word will speak, will bear fruit, and will be a testimony unto them. Look at that sentence again. Take heed to yourselves, live for his sake, faithfully enduring persecution. Faithfully enduring persecution. We'll come back to Mark chapter 13 and we're looking at verse 9. It says, but take it yourselves, but they shall deliver you all to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. In the synagogues, ye shall be beaten. But understand, uh, you are not there alone. The Father is with you. During persecution, the Son of God is with you. During persecution, the Holy Ghost abides in you. And the beating will mean nothing. The presence of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost, and the enduring stability of the Holy Ghost will be so strong in you that what the beating, the persecution, and the jesting, whatever the persecution, will not matter at all. It says, take it yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the council, and in the synagogue ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before the rulers and the kings for my sake, and for a testimony against them. In verse 12, it tells us, and now, brother, shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents. Now, if the parents are Christians, if the parents are born again, if the parents are children of God, 
and now a child that you brought into the world a child you gave back to he has grown up he knows some sputtering of uh, english or whatever language he knows a little bit of this a little bit of that and then he becomes uh, uncontrollable at home and he rises up against you now if you break down and if you start crying my child my son my daughter is doing all this the moment you start crying you become weaker and the one the child was not born again and jesus said it will happen and when it happens and you're crying and you're mourning you're fasting you're praying you cannot eat you are regretting what have i come to i'm suffering so much even outsiders treat me better even children of other people in the community they treat me better my child is treating me like this you become weak and when you become weak like that and the child is still doing what you will do according to prophecy according to the prediction of the lord jesus christ it will overwhelm you. It will overcome you. But it says at such a time, you take your stand and you keep on living for the Lord and don't mind what any child, what any parent, what anyone will do. Your faith in Christ is number one. And your, your stand for Christ is number one. And your readiness for the coming of the Lord is number one. If the child will not be ready for the coming of the Lord, if the person will not be ready for the coming of the Lord, instead of Christ losing you both, you take your stand. And you know, by taking your stand, and that child will see that this sin does not affect you. That can bring conviction as a testimony unto them. And then you say, shall cause them to be put to death. At such a time you deal. That's how Romans chapter 8 comes into your life. In Romans chapter 8 verse 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. It's saying, whatever may be happening as we are getting close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The persecution, the tribulation, the distress, and the famine, and the nakedness, and the poverty, the peril, the danger, the sword, the wars, and the rumors of wars. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I think it's better for you to make that personal. Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Think about things around you. Is uh, so and so so precious to you? That if so and so turns his back, turns her back against you, that will separate you from Christ. And then you'll be begging them and pleading with them. I'm sorry I went too far. I'm sorry I had salvation. I'm sorry I believed in holiness. I'm sorry I'm thinking about the coming of the Lord. What? That means you allow that person is so precious can take heaven from you. That person is so great can take eternal life from you. What and who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Look at verse 36. It says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for slaughter. I like verse 37. Verse 37, here ought to be your verse and the verse you stand on. It says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. And now he goes back in verse 38. It says in verse 38, for I am persuaded, for I am persuaded, for you must be persuaded. For we are persuaded, one and all, young and old. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. There may be things that are not even there today. Like we're hearing about a pandemic that we didn't know about last year, didn't know about two years ago things to come whatever may come some things have come already things present other things may still come 
whatever it is, I am persuaded that none of those things, verse 39, shall separate, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us, shall be able to separate me, shall be able to separate you, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You will endure unto the end in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, from verse 9. Matthew chapter 24, reading there from verse 9. It says, They shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Always for my name's sake. Not because we want to do evil, not because we are lawbreakers, not because we are bad citizens, not because we are violating any standard, any legitimate law, but for his name's sake. And then he says in verse 10, in verse 10 he says, and then shall many be offended. Many people who are not stable, Many people do not know the persecution goes along with a Christian stand. Then shall many be offended, and they shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. They think that, you know, if they have been part of the fellowship of the people of God, and then they are getting persecuted, and then they say, well, instead of being persecuted, and they join the enemy camp, and all the, all the things they knew, what they were calling, because the secrets of the body of Christ, and the secrets of the assembly, and the secrets of the, of the leaders in the church, they then begin to tell the unbelievers, you know, when we're there, this is their doctrine, when we're there, this is their emphasis, when we're there, this is what they said, they will betray the people of God into the hands of the unbelievers, and they shall hate one another. In fact, it says, you go further in verse 11, and it says, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. That's why Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. Don't be overconfident and don't dabble into this and dabble into that and read this and pick up this and pick up that and go to this night vigil and go to that night vigil and access uh, this uh, site and access that site. Take it yourself and many false prophets shall rise and it shall deceive many. In verse 12 it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then in verse 13, here is your verse, here is your verse and my verse. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He or she, the believer, the righteous one, the saved one, the sanctified one, the steadfast one that shall endure unto the end, saying, what come way, I get to heaven. What come me, I will make it. What come me, I will stand. What come me, I, I will not. Whatever will come, I will not compromise my stand. That's the person that will say, let the heat be hotter than that. Let the furnace be heated more than that. And let the challenges even multiply. All the same, I am going to endure. I've laid my hands on the plow and I will not look back. That's the person that shall endure to the end and it shall come to final salvation. We'll come to point number two now. In point number two, it's talking about the spirit field witnesses devoted to soul saving proclamation. Spirit field witnesses devoted to soul saving proclamation. The Lord has called us witnesses. He says, we're witnesses of the kingdom. We're witnesses of the gospel. He shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's what we are. Witnesses unto me. But witnesses that are spirit-filled. 
witnesses that are spirit indwelt, witnesses that are spirit controlled, witnesses that are spirit propelled and spirit energized, and they are passionate by the infilling and by the energizing, by the enablement of the Spirit of God. Spirit filled witnesses devoted to soul saving proclamation. In Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 10, the gospel and the gospel must be published among all nations. The gospel, the word of God, the good news, the word of salvation, and the word of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel must be first published among all nations. And then in verse 11, it says, but when they shall lead you and deliver you, take no thought beforehand what is your speak? Don't hesitate. Don't say, how can I talk now? What will I say now? I will the challenges and the look and the facial appearance of the people I'm supposed to talk to and the way they act and the way they respond and the way they snub and the way they look down and the way they belittle and the way they reject. What am I going to say? He said, don't even take thought beforehand. What he shall speak? Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given to you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. It is not you speaking, but the Holy Ghost. If I paraphrase those two verses, verses 10 and 11, I'll paraphrase it like this. The gospel must be preached without hesitation through the Spirit's enablement. The gospel must be preached without hesitation through the Spirit's enablement. Look at the first part of that sentence. The gospel must be preached. We're told in that Mark chapter 13, verse 10 again, the gospel must first be preached among all nations. I want you to underline your Bible those two words must first it's a must whatever is happening this is a must we're able to go out or we're logged in this is a must we're able to interact this is a must the interaction is limited physical interaction physical contact this is a must it's in the morning afternoon or evening this is a must we're looking for something to eat and uh, things are not all available. This is a must. The gospel must first be published. The word first. That is, it comes as a priority in our lives. This is the must. This is the essential thing. This is the priority. This is number one. If you add a lot of things before you, do I preach the gospel? Or do I go for extra moral studies? This one is first. Do I preach the gospel? Or do I go to the seaside to have a picnic? This one is the number one must first be published. Do I uh, preach the gospel? Or do I go for, you know, something else somewhere? Whatever that thing may be, however good, however positive, however advantageous, this gospel must force number one in your life it must first be published among all nations in your community beyond your community in your region beyond your region in your state beyond your state anywhere everywhere among all nations and then he tells us in luke chapter 4 the lord jesus has given us an example has given us an illustration of that word must. That word must. It says, And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God. That's the gospel. I must preach the message of salvation. That's the gospel. I must preach how to enter into the kingdom of God. That is the gospel. I must preach the new birth. This is the kingdom. It says, I must. I must. I must. There must come a time in your life when you kneel down before the Lord. And you kneel down in absolute surrender. And you kneel down in absolute consecration. 
and you open the Bible and you see that verse that says, I must preach the kingdom of God. You say, Lord, I belong to you now. How you live is how I'm going to live. Your priority is going to be my priority. Your passion is going to be my passion. Your sacrifice is going to be my sacrifice. Your dedication to service is going to be my dedication. And Lord, I commit myself to you in consecration. I must first preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. Therefore am I kept alive. Therefore am I kept healthy. Therefore am I given the gospel. Therefore do I have the privilege. The gospel must be preached. In Romans chapter 1 verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians. Both to the wise and to the wise. That's a person that says I have a debt to pay. I have the gospel to preach. And it says, I am debtor. This is what I must do. And my debt is to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the educated and to the uneducated, unenlightened, both to the wise and to the unwise. And then in verse 15, it says, So, as much as in me is, as much as life remains in me, as much as I can still stand on my feet, as much as I have breath to breathe, as much as I have the life to live, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Then he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed. When there is something you must do, I am not ashamed. When there is a place you must go, I am not ashamed. There is something you must declare, I am not ashamed. There is Christ you must uplift, you must exalt and present to the people. There is no shame, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power, it is the power, that gospel, it has power. That message, it has power. That sacrifice of Christ on the cross, it has power. And this ministry, the ministry of the world, it has power. That gospel of Christ has power. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And that's why you are preaching. You are not preaching just to fulfill all righteousness. You are preaching to persuade the people to believe. To persuade them to accept. To persuade them to give their hearts and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, how would you do that? We we'll do that without hesitation. Without thinking. Without being anxious. Without being afraid. Without holding back. Look at Mark chapter 13 Mark chapter 13 we're reading from the first part of verse 11 Mark chapter 13 we're reading from verse 11 and it says when they shall lead you and deliver you up take no thought beforehand don't take too much time I'm trying to search the Bible I'm trying to memorize some verses of the Bible I'm trying to get hold of the scriptures. I'm trying to understand this, understand that. I'm trying to think about what questions they might ask, how I will answer them. It says, take no thought beforehand. What ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. What's it saying? It's saying, go without any hesitation. Go without any drawing back. Go without any anxiety. Go without fretting. And go without uh, beating about the bush. Go straight. The gospel must be preached. 
and it must be preached without hesitation. Come to Exodus chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 10. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I'm not eloquent, that's hesitating, neither heretofore nor since thou art spoken unto thy servant, that's hesitating, but I am slow of speech, that's hesitating, and of a slow tongue. That the one the Lord is saying is, don't consider all that, your deficiencies and your incapacities or your inability, whatever, go preach the word without hesitation. Already you are saved. That same word that saved you, give it to others. Already you are born again. That gospel you heard and it convinced you and you are born again, present it like that. Already you are a child of God and you know Christ is coming. That conviction you have, go tell other people and don't hesitate at all. Do it without hesitation. Look at Exodus chapter 4 verse 11. Exodus chapter 4 verse 11. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Who has made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seen, or the blind, have not I the Lord? I made you the way you are. If you think you are slow, I made you the way you are. And I know what I was going to use you for. And I know the Holy Ghost in you can energize you, can empower you, can come upon you, can propel you, can compel you, can enlighten you. The Holy Ghost is enough to do the work in you through you. There should be no hesitation. Uh, look at that same, uh, look at verse 12 now. Exodus chapter 4 verse 12. Now therefore go. No hesitation. Now therefore go. No drawing back. Now therefore go. And I will be with thy mouth. That's all we need. That's all we need. I will be with thy mouth. When you open your mouth, I will be with thy mouth. When you want to say what you ought to say, I will be with your mouth. When you want to publish the gospel, preach the gospel, I will be with your mouth and teach thee. I don't know enough. God will teach you. I don't have enough. God will give to you. I don't know what I'm going to say. It will supply the utterance and the message. And teach thee what thou shalt say. It's saying that we have a job to do. We have a work to do. And we should not give any reason whatsoever to hesitate. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. We're reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6. Then said I, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. That's hesitation. That's drawing back. That's holding back. That's saying, I cannot do what the Lord has said I can do. God said, you can. You say, you cannot. Who is telling a lie? God said, go. You say, you cannot go. Who is telling a lie? God says, this is what to do. You say, but you don't have the strength. You don't have the power. Who is telling a lie? The Lord says, this is the calling you have. And this is why I set you apart. And this is why I separated you. This is why I raised you up. And then you mustn't say any other thing different when God has spoken and he says, go. All you need to do is go without any hesitation. Then said I, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. The God let him off the hook just because he said, I cannot. Does God let you go? All right. Accept. You cannot. You're hesitating. And because you're hesitating and you say you cannot, although I knew you could, although I created you and I know you can, but since you say you cannot, all right, I leave you alone. Look at verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee. I give you a message, good news, you'll preach that. I give you a message of judgment, you'll preach that. I give you a message of warning, you'll preach that. I give you a message that Christ is coming, 
and his coming is imminent, you'll preach that. I give you a message that rapture is going to take place. And the rapture will be before the great tribulation. Open your mouth and declare that. It says, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. It tells us in verse 8. In verse 8 it says, be not afraid of their faces. It will be with you. Be not afraid of their utterances. It will be with you. Be not afraid of their rejection. Be not afraid of their frowns. Be not afraid of their terror. Be not afraid of their fighting. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. The Lord will be with you. The Lord will go with you. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will empower you, energize you to do and to say all you need to say and all you need to do in Jesus' name. Look at verse 9 now. In verse 9, then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. Touch my mouth, the Lord will touch your mouth. And the Lord will put the words in your mouth. And the Lord will put the courage in your heart. He will give you the strength in your backbone. And he will give you everything you need, the weapon you need to do everything as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. He put forth his hand and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Plural, my words, plural, my words, plural, in thy mouth. You have to speak to sinner, the word is there. You have to speak to a backslider, the word is there. You have to speak to uh, the saints, the word of God is there. You have to speak to the young, it will enable you. I don't know how to talk to young people. I don't know how to talk to children. I don't know how to talk to women. I don't know how to talk to educated people. My words are the plural. I have put my words in thy mouth. And you'll declare that word without hesitation in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, we're reading from verse 14. Here is the promise of the Lord for us, all the children of God. It says, set to lead therefore in your hearts. Set to lead therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before. What he shall answer? No hesitation. No holding back. No drawing back. No wavering. No indecision. Without hesitation, we go forth and we preach the word. Settle it there for your hearts, not to meditate before what he shall answer. Verse 15, it says, For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom. I will give you a mouth different from the mouth of weakness, of fear, of timidity, different from the uh, mouth that is saying, I'm ignorant, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So then, the gospel must be preached without hesitation. How? Through the Spirit's enablement. Through the Spirit's enablement. Look at that, Mark chapter 13 again, verse 11. It is the Spirit's enablement. It is the Spirit that will quicken us, energize us, enlighten us, and put the light before us so that we can see clearly how to present the gospel to every person, every prospect that comes before us. It says, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever, whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. It is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. But when they shall deliver you up, take no thought how. Or what he shall speak, but it shall be given you in that same hour. It shall be given you in that same hour. 
Oh, watch him before you go out. You don't know what you are going to say. It will be giving you when the hour comes. What if you don't know how to approach all those people you have heard about them? They, they ask questions and they jibble you here and there. And from what I've heard, I don't know I'm going to witness. I don't know I'm going to share the gospel. I don't know I will start with my testimony. I don't know how I will bring them to the realization all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. I don't know how I will tell them your effort and your good works cannot save you. I don't know I'm going to tell them that whatever you do, you cannot save yourself. But Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It says, don't even worry about that. Just go in the confidence of the Spirit's enablement because it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. It tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and verse 12. Luke chapter 12, we're reading from verse 11. Luke chapter 12, verse 11, and when they bring you unto the synagogues, different synagogues, and unto the magistrates, uh, different magistrates, and unto the powers, the powers that be authoritative people, take no thought how or what thing he shall answer. Or what ye shall say in verse 12, it says in verse 12, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you, is to teach you. It will bring to your remembrance everything you have heard, everything you have read, everything you have prayed about, everything you have prayed on. All these messages we are hearing, the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. It happened experientially to Peter like that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, he was brought before the Sanhedrin. He was brought before those leaders. He was brought before the council. Why are you doing this? Have we not warned you? And this and that. And then Peter filled what the Holy Ghost said unto them. You see that there's no premeditation. And there is no hesitation. And there is no drawing back. At that same hour when they asked him, we're told, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, ye rulers, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, verse 9, in verse 9, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this important man, by what means he is made whole. Then in verse 10, he tells them, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. There's no premeditation here. And there's no hesitation here. There is nothing here that says, uh, Well, what am I going to say? What will I tell them? And these people, they know the Old Testament. What will I declare? The Holy Ghost came upon him. And the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And he said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Look at Peter. Look at him being confrontational and look at him telling them directly, this is the man that denied Christ when he was fearful, when he was timid, when that maid came. But now the Holy Ghost came on him and he told them, it's by the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. And then in verse 11, it says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the hedge of the corner. And now he tells them uh, something so true. And so valid then and now in verse 12. And it says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name is the only Savior. 
No other name is the only Redeemer. No other name is the only King of Kings and Lord of Lords. No other name is the only one that can take us from earth unto heaven. No other name is only through him we can come to the Father. We'll come to point number three now. And we're reading from verse 13. We're looking at Mark chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 13 in this point he's talking to us about the watchmen about the carriers of the gospel about the people that will take the gospel and take it everywhere whatever the condition whatever may be happening the people that will take the gospel to all the parts of the world and they will stand and they will persevere and there will be no timidity there will be no fear there will be no hesitation at all. Look at that verse 13 of Mark chapter 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. Already we are saved. That's initial salvation. And when it says shall be saved, that's future that's the final salvation. And to get to that final salvation, now we're children of God. We're waiting for the rapture, for the imminent return of Christ. And between the time of our regeneration to the time of the rapture, there will be things to endure. There will be things to pass through. And we endure that. And one of those things Christ has highlighted is the hatred of all men for his name's sake. Let me uh, put that verse in this way for you to understand. Common hatred must be endured for final salvation. Common hatred must be endured for final salvation. What does that mean? When it says, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. It's saying that hatred is common. You see, sometimes when we're going through something, it's like I'm the only one in the world going through this. I have this headache. There's no headache like my headache. I have challenges, no challenges like mine. I have difficulties, no difficulties like mine. I have rejection, no rejection like mine. You know, the people that give up on life and the people that take their lives, you know what they're thinking about? Nobody suffers like I'm suffering. Nobody is going through what I'm going through. And because the hatred, the rejection is uncommon, it's peculiar. It's just me alone that is in this funnies, in this challenge, because and nobody can understand. That's why they do what they do. But the Lord is saying, it's common. It's common. Look at that again. He shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. When it says ye there, it happened to the disciples in the first century. It's happening to disciples in this present century. It's happening to believers in this country. Happening to believers in those other countries. It's common. Look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 22. Luke chapter 6 verse 22. It says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. When men shall hate you. And when they shall separate you from their company. And shall reproach you. And cast your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, rejoice ye in that day and live for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Look at this now. Look at this. For in the like manner did their fathers to the prophets. It's common. It's not something so strange that it never happened to other people before. It happened to the prophets and the people and the children of God that were before us. And it says, because it's common and other people overcame, you too, you can overcome. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 18. In John chapter 15 verse 18, here is what the Lord Jesus told his disciples. If the world hates you, know ye that it hated me before it hated you. It's not something peculiar. 
It's not something special. It's not something uncommon. That's the world. That's the world. Unrighteousness will hate righteousness. He that is born of the flesh will hate he that is born of the spirit. He that is of the world will hate he that is of heaven. If the world hates you, know ye that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world will love his own. If you were not born again, if you were of the devil, if you were of the same spiritual parents, they will love you. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Everyone that is chosen out of the world, ecclesia, called out of the world, ecclesia, the people that have come out of darkness, they have come out of evil, they have come out of their sin. They have come out of all iniquity. And they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they abandon themselves. They devote themselves. They dedicate themselves unto the Lord and to the Lord alone. It says, because I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, you see, this is common to everyone who is chosen out of the world. Therefore, the world hated you. Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20 it says, remember the word that I speak, that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, it's common, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Verse 21, in verse 21, but all these things they will do unto you. For my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Because they know not him that sent me. So understand, whatever challenges you are going through, not peculiar, come on. Look at First Peter chapter 5, verse 9. First Peter chapter 5, we're looking at verse 9. And here is still reminding us that it's happening to other people. Even those who are not born again, are, are they are not sinners that are hated by other sinners. Are they are not neighbors that are hated by other neighbors. That's why it says you are a believer. You have the power. You have the wherewithal. And you have the strength to resist the devil. Whom resist ye steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, in your relatives, in other people that are in the world. It's a common thing. And so we must endure. You will endure. I said you will endure. If I what is happening to you, if anything is happening at all, it's not up to one, uh, one part, a fraction of what happened to the early believers. And they endured until the very end. And we have the same gospel. We have the same Savior. We have the same Redeemer. We have the same Holy Ghost. We have the same power. We have the same strength. If they endured, you can endure. You will endure. Common hatred must be endured. We're coming back to Mark chapter 13. I'm reading from that verse 13. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end. He that shall endure unto the end. You know, we've been enduring, enduring, enduring. Keep on enduring. Just a little bit of time more. Just a little season more, just a little period more, he that shall endure unto the end. Whatever we're going through, whatever the challenges might be, and whatever the difficulties might be, he gives us strength. He made us endure yesterday. The God of yesterday is the God of today. The Redeemer of yesterday is the Redeemer of today. The strengthener of yesterday, of yesteryears, is the strengthener, is the energizer, is the enabler of the present day. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And the God of the day is the God of the night. And the God of past years is the God of this 
this year we must keep on enduring by that power he has transferred into our lives. That's why he tells us in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading there from verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, it says, And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, hatred shall abound, wickedness shall abound, and on common things the people do against believers in persecution shall abound. The unexpected, because those works of iniquity shall abound, some people will hunt down. Some people will give up. Some people will give in. Some people will collapse. Some people will cringe. Some people will compromise. The love of many shall wax cold. But understand, you must keep on enduring if you're going to have the final salvation. Look at verse 13 now. It says in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, he that shall endure unto the end, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You need to keep on looking at the future, at the future reward, at the future salvation, at the future crown, at the future recommendation, at the future commendation of the Lord. And as you look at the future crown, as you look at the future prize, as you look at the future reward, that is what makes you to endure. And you say, I know it will not be long. I know it will soon be over. And when it's over, I know it's over. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. There, thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardship as a good soldier, of Jesus Christ in verse 4, it says, No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life. No man that worries, you are a soldier of Christ, don't act like a worldly person. Don't act like a street man, a street woman, a street boy, a street girl. You are a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't act like an ordinary person. No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. The Lord has chosen you. The Lord has strengthened you. He has not only chosen you, he has also equipped you. And he has put the armor on you. He has put the power on in you. And because he has done that, you will endure. You will endure in Jesus' name. I said you will endure in Jesus' name. It says in verse 5, it says in verse 5 here, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he see not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Everything you do, you do it lawfully, preach lawfully, pray lawfully, wage war against sin lawfully, and be a good soldier and walk according to the word and according to the rule. It says in James chapter 1 verse 12, James chapter 1 verse 12, it tells us here the crown for those who endure. The crown for those who persist. The crown for those who are stable. The crown for those who are steadfast until the end. In James chapter 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man. Blessed is the believer. Blessed is that righteous one. Blessed is the child of God that endures trial. That endures temptation. That endures difficulty. That endures Hardness in the way of the believer. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You will not miss that crown. You will not miss that final victory, that final triumph, and that final salvation, that final well done in Jesus' name. Final salvation, you will get there. I will get there. We shall get there in Jesus' name. Common hatred must be endured 
for final salvation. Come back to Mark chapter 13. We're looking at verse 13. Mark chapter 13, verse 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. As I told you before, and as you know it yourself, there is initial salvation. The moment a person turns away from sin and he turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment a person says, I repent, I turn away from myself, I turn away from old religion, I turn away from old manner of life, I turn away from all those bad habits, I turn away from transgression and iniquity, and I turn unto Jesus Christ who died for me and gave himself for me that I might be saved. I believe, I hold unto him that moment he is saved. That's initial salvation. Romans chapter 10. Reading from verse 8. In Romans chapter 10, it tells us from verse 8, but what says it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that is, you accept, you receive, you believe, the Lordship of Christ, and you confess that, that Jesus is your Lord, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Initial salvation. In verse 10, for with the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's initial salvation. And that can take place, if you are not saved yet, right here now. In that place where you are, you turn away from sin, and you really feel sorry for your sin, and you throw away the sin, and you turn away from that, and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. This day will be your day of salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 2. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 2. For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation, day of salvation, have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can add that, that today. Initial salvation, the day of salvation. But remember the words of Jesus. He that endures to the end, it's not talking about the end, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. What kind of salvation is that? Final salvation. That's the salvation that comes and then you enter in literally into the kingdom of God. And at that time of that salvation final, no temptation anymore, no trial anymore, no crying anymore, no difficulties anymore, and no challenges anymore, and there is uh, no prayer anymore. Everything is now concluded, and you have endured to the end and shall be saved. Final salvation. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. There's a final salvation is talking about now. And that knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That's talking about that future final salvation. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. We are born again. He has begotten us again. We have that initial salvation. We have that assurance and witness of sonship in Christ, sonship through Christ, 
according to his abundant mercy, we have begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In verse 4, it says in verse 4 to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. He now explains everything in verse 5 about that final salvation who are kept, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's talking about the final salvation. Already today, we have studied from Mark chapter 13. And we have seen what the word of God has revealed unto us of the final preservation of steadfast believers. And if you're a believer, you're a child of God, he wants you to endure to the end. He wants you to persevere unto the end so that you'll be preserved until the final day. We have learned about the saints watchfulness during severe persecution and whatever persecution, whatever difficulty, whatever danger may be there, challenges that may be there now, be watchful and take each unto yourself and then be spirit filled, be spirit propelled and spirit endured so that you will carry the saving gospel unto other people. Be a watchman, be a watchwoman and be a child child of God, a soul winner, and be a member of the body of Christ that is strengthening, that you are dedicated, and you are holding fast, steadfastly, persevering until the final salvation. The Lord be with you. The Lord strengthen you. The Spirit of God fill you and make you to be the child of God and the Son of God and the Saint of God that you ought to be in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up now. Talk to the Lord in prayer. We must take in the word. We must transfer the word from the pages of the scriptures and transfer to our hearts or must transfer it from the head to the heart. We must make sure that every promise we have read about and every injunction the Lord has given us and every warning he has given us and every challenge he has given us, we transfer that to the heart now so that we can be strengthened, so we can take heed to everything he called us to take heed to and we lay for his sake. Challenges will come, you lay for his sake. Whatever may come there, you lay for his sake. And whatever you are called upon to demonstrate, you do it for his sake. And there is no attitude if it's not, it's not for his sake. And there is no back, uh, back, uh, backward uh, movement if it's not for his sake. Anything you are going to do, anything you are going to say, understand you are going to take uncompromisingly. When temptations come, when trials come, when difficulties come, that Everything you do, you think about it, this not for my sake. This not to get out of trouble. And this is not to avoid this, avoid that. This is a life that is lived for his sake. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, it will strengthen you. It will energize you. Take heed unto yourself. Take heed unto yourself. Live for his sake and faithfully endure persecution. What are you going through at home, with neighbors, with friends, with those people that do not agree with your stand, with your faith? Faithfully endure that persecution and the Lord will see you through. Let the Spirit of God so fill you. Let the Spirit of God so control you. Let the Spirit of God so energize you that you take the gospel, you hold on to the gospel, you pray the gospel in, you push the gospel through to people, you penetrate the lives of people with the gospel. Make it a must in your life. And make it number one in your life. The gospel must first be published. And it's by you and by me and by us together without hesitation. Without hesitation. Without complaint. Without excuses. Without saying, I cannot. I, yes, you can. 
God says you can. God says you must. It's a duty, a challenge he has given to you. And you do that through the Spirit's enablement. Don't think. Don't take thoughts. Don't premeditate. Don't think so much until you think yourself into weakness or inability. You can. You will. You must. The Spirit will enable you. Will energize you. Will envelope you. Will sustain you. And you do it in the strength and the power of the Lord. Not only that now, you must be strengthened as a watchman. Dedicated is steadfast perseverance. Hatred, that's common. Pressure, that's common. Rejection, that's common. Lying against you, slander, that's common. Persecution, that's common. Rejection, that's common. Endure that. Others have endured. You too can endure. And you too can stand. And you too can keep your backbone and the strength of the Spirit of God. You are saved. Let no one take that confidence of salvation away from you. Keep on enduring. It will not be long. The trumpet will sound. It will not be long. The dead in Christ shall rise. It will not be long. We which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'll see you on that day. You'll see me on that day because we made up our minds today to have the grace of God that will help us, enable us to endure unto the end. You will endure to the end in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You have not held anything back from us. Anything profitable, anything that is practical, anything that will prepare us for your coming. You have not held anything away from us. We are praying, O oh Lord, in all the challenges anyone may face, in all the persecution any of us may face, we are asking you know, that this word of the gospel, you remind us every time, will stand on it every time, and we will stand solid and stable, steadfast every time, and your spirit will enable, energize us, empower us every time that we will endure whatever may come, the hardness that will come to the life of the spiritual soldier, of the saint of God, of the child of God, of the servant of God, we will endure to the very end in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, not to look back. Help us, Lord, not to backslide. Help us, Lord, not to cringe. Help us, Lord, not to collapse. Help us, Lord, not to faint by the way. Help us to keep on standing, standing in the truth, standing for the truth, and standing and preaching the word of God that you have given us, that will bring other people to you into the kingdom in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered the grace, the strength, the power, the enablement to endure to the very end, day by day, one day at a time, give to every one of us. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. And when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, Lord, we will be there. And we'll meet you and see you face to face, and see one another face to face on the final day in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.